Amen. Well, last uh, Thursday, I began to teach a teaching on the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I want to continue along that line. You know, there's a lot of mysteries when it comes to the kingdom of God that my natural mind, it doesn't understand. And, and actually, you know, when you look at the world, how they're trying to figure out how everything came to be and they're spending billions and trillions of dollars researching how the world came into existence, we discovered in, in Genesis chapter one, God said, let there be. It's the reality of faith, it's faith. Uh, the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God because it's spirit and spiritually discerned. Um, the fact that uh, without controversy, greatest mystery of godliness for God was manifested in the flesh, justified in his spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. So we, we uh, you know, when it comes to faith, faith is more than just believing. We know, we know, we, we know those who are born again and washed in the blood, uh, who have believed on Christ, who have received Christ, we know that we know that we know that Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. We know that he lived amongst us. We know that he took our sins, he took our suffering, our pain, our agony, our punishment. He was separated from the Father. He gave up the ghost. Uh, he declared, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He died, but he rose again three days later. We know that. Our whole life is built and based on this reality. Now, we can preach this and declare this and proclaim this to those who don't know Christ, but if the Father doesn't draw them, they won't come. It, the Holy Ghost has got to quicken it to them. Well, you know, if you get to thinking about whatever aspect of Christ you want to look at, uh, the, the covenant, uh, the blessings, the provisions, the words, the life, the character, the nature, the personality of Jesus. To me, it's all mind boggling. It, it's beyond human understanding. Now, I want to talk about the blood of Christ tonight because really it doesn't make any sense to the natural mind. But the Bible says uh, there, there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood the blood of Jesus. And last uh, Thursday, I took you, there's actually 15 major declarations that tells us in the New Testament what the blood of Christ does. And, and of course, we can't cover all of these. I covered about four of them last week. But I, I, in the book of Hebrews alone, it speaks about the blood of Jesus 20 times in the book of Hebrews. And I just love the fact that we got technology now where I remember when I first began to preach, I had all, I had concordances and I had, you know, the expository dictionaries, my whole dining room table was full of books and I'm trying to look up the Greek and the Hebrew and it would take me hours and hours what I can do now in a matter of minutes because of, you know, because the software, you can do it even do online, you can download an app and just type the word blood in there and look up every time the word blood is used in the New Testament. But I wanna read these scriptures in the book of Hebrews, not all of them, but some of them that kind of give us an insight into the blood. Where would we be without the blood? Well, we couldn't be saved. We couldn't be redeemed. We, uh, there would be no atonement. There would be no redemption. Uh, there'd be no salvation without the blood of Jesus. And we realize that blood, the first time blood was shed in the old covenant was when Abel offered up the lamb and they had this knowledge all the way back. Uh, the, 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 the second son of Adam had this knowledge that there had to be the shedding of blood. And of course, the very clothes that God clothed them with were uh, sheepskin. So God himself, he committed the first sacrifice when he had taken those sheep and offered them up and covered Adam and Eve's nakedness. But then, of course, uh, uh, Abel, he offered up a, a lamb, and uh, his brother Cain, he offered up vegetables. Well, that didn't work. God didn't accept his offering. But even when Cain slayed Abel, and it talks about this in Hebrews, the blood the righteous blood of Abel still cries from the ground. Well, if the righteous blood of Abel still cries from the ground, then what do we think the blood of Jesus is doing to this day throughout eternity? And actually the blood in the old covenant when uh, Moses received the Levitical laws and, uh, and, and, and we see it in uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy, Leviticus, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, God demanded and required his people to, to, to uh, shed the blood of animals 
in order to uh, represent what Christ himself was going to do. That's what the Passover lamb was all about, that they had to take. Remember, they ke- uh, God kept on doing signs and wonders and miracles, but uh, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he wouldn't release the people of Israel. And God said, this will break the stronghold of Egypt over you, and you're going to take a lamb without spot, without blemish, uh, the, the, a, a male lamb that, that, that uh, broke came forth first from a, from a sheep, and you're going to take that, uh, that blood, you're going to catch it in a bowl, and you're going to take hyssop, and then you're going to have to dip it in the, in, into the blood, and you're going to have to strike the doorpost and the lintos, and that way the death angel would, could not come into their house. And so it's the blood, the blood that prevents the enemy from just coming in and destroying God's people. So there's something really amazing about the blood. But in in the uh, book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 7, I'm just going to read some of these scriptures. But uh, into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So when he went into the Holy of Holies, which was a type and a shadow of the heavenly things, because when Christ died and shed all of his blood, every drop of blood that was in the body of Jesus was poured out every drop from the moment that they began to beat him until they whipped him at the post until he carried the cross up to Golgotha's hill till they nailed him. And then when they finally pierced his side and forthwith came what blood and then water. That means every drop of blood that was in the body of Jesus was poured out. Now we know life is in the blood and you can't live without blood. And your body contains approximately two gallons. A grown up person's body has about one gallon, excuse me, one gallon and two pints of blood. Well, a sheep, a full grown sheep has approximately a a, a gallon of blood. Now when uh, they say that when Solomon offered up the temple, when they, they, they uh, uh, offered up the sacrifices at the dedication of the temple, over 200, 50,000 sheep and livestock were slaughtered and literally when they built the uh, uh, the temple they actually had to build it with troughs that would carry the blood away like a river so on that one day alone over 250,000 gallons of blood I mean it's hard for us to understand this 250,000 gallons of blood poured forth and yet it never wiped away one sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's why all religions except Christianity, and really it's not a religion, it's, 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 a, it's a transformation, it's a, a lifestyle, it's a new dimension, but none of the other religions have what it takes to, br- to bring redemption to one human being. And yet can you imagine the gallon of blood that Jesus shed was enough to forgive all the sins from the beginning in Genesis all the way to the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? One gallon of blood. How how powerful is that blood? How awesome, how magnificent is that blood? And they overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, and not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, the blood of Jesus, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So there's a word, redemption. There's 15 major declarations about the blood of Jesus, and he purchased for us redemption with his blood. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So there's something about faith in the blood. So how do we apply the blood? People say, I plead the blood. Well, really, you know, the word plead, you mean you're going to apply the blood. How? By faith. By faith. We do it by faith. How do we get born again? By faith in Jesus Christ. I have faith that the blood that Jesus shed was enough to set me free from the powers of darkness. 
You got to have faith in the blood. Those Israelites, when they took that blood of the lamb and they hit the doorpost and the lintel and they were in the house, they were standing upon their feet with a staff in their hand. And actually the, they roasted, they roasted the lamb and it was, it was cooked with bitter herbs. And the reason why is because the death of Christ, listen, you know, I, 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 when I eat ham, I, I like it, you know, uh, soaked in, 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 in honey and brown sugar. You know, you make your meat taste sweet. Well, the lamb was, bitter it was bitter why because the death of christ the sufferings of christ the agony of christ it, it, it's it, it's mind-boggling but it wasn't it, it's not pleasant i mean we know it's beautiful it's amazing but it was it was painful i mean in in the garden uh in in the, uh, in the garden uh that christ was uh was was betrayed uh and I, I was actually in that garden when my wife and i went to israel uh mount olives we were there where christ had been praying and and he sweated as it was great drops of blood before he even got to the cross great drops of blood because the sins of the world were being placed upon him your sin and my sin but in in the old covenant the, the 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 all of the levites can you imagine now the the levites were the ones who are sacrificing the animals and by the end of the day when they got done on the end of the passover day when they had when they had sanctified the temple for uh, solomon had built they were covered in blood from head to toe but one thing the the high priest would have to do is he would have to take and he would have to dip into the blood and he would sprinkle the people and cover the people in blood that they did they covered us aren't you, don't you know where people covered in the blood we're covered under the precious blood of jesus we don't see it physically but that's what the father sees the father sees the blood of his son upon us and it not only uh, 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 covers our sin but it washes away our sin it purges our sin As a matter of fact it says what does it do here it says that he purges our conscience from dead works in order to serve the living god Hebrews 9 18 whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying this is the blood of the testament which God enjoyed unto you moreover he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things are by the law purged and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission so can we imagine, let's say, let's say they don't know how many people came out of Egypt, anywhere from 2 million to 5 million people. Moses went through that whole multitude and he spread blood over every one of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Every one of them. They were covered in the blood. Uh, I'm covered by the blood. Aren't you glad for the blood of Jesus? There is no salvation outside of the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For in other words, the blood of Christ once and for all did what all the blood that they shed through all of those 2,000 years of history could not do. And Jesus doesn't have to keep dying every Passover. He is the Passover. He shed his blood. I mean, there's so much power in the blood. You know, we say there's power, power, wonder-working power. I, wa I wonder if we understand or comprehend how much power there is in the blood of Jesus to redeem every human soul that would repent and believe on him. Uh, amazing, amazing. And that blood ever liveth. The blood that Jesus shed was literally Jesus himself delivered it. There is a mercy seat in heaven. There is a throne in heaven. There is, a, a, and, and Jesus put his blood upon that mercy seat in heaven. And that blood ever liveth. That blood is still alive. It's living blood. It's not dead blood. You know, when you kill an animal, basically the blood dies. But the blood of Christ, it'll never die, even as Christ himself. Now, how the human mind can comprehend this, you, you can't. You just got to accept it by faith. His blood ever speaketh. His blood is ever, his blood still says and shouts redeemed, forgiven, ransomed, atoned. It's still crying out to this day. Uh, in Hebrews 10, 4, for it is not possible that the blood of goats and of bulls should take away sins. 
But in chapter 10, verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in to the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So we go to the throne of grace in a time of need because not of our righteousness or our goodness or our accomplishments or even our own holiness. We, we, because our holiness comes from God or our righteousness comes from God, but we can enter into the holy of holies through the blood of Jesus that has been applied to us the moment we believed. The moment you believed on Christ, that he is who he says he is, and he's done what he said he's done, and that he's been raised from the dead, that blood covered you in the eyes of the Father. So we can come before the throne of grace in a time of need to help, to, 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 to apprehend grace and mercy to help in a time of need. You know, so if the devil ever throws your accusations before you and the Bible says, confess your sins and he's faithful and just for, to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What does that? It's the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, we go to the heavenly father. You know, a lot of times when I pray for people and it doesn't say you have to say by the blood, but I, I, I just for my own faith and for the faith of those I'm praying for, I'll say in the name, in the name of Jesus, uh, by, by the authority of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, by the word of Jesus, I command you to be healed in Jesus name. Uh, and, and, and you don't have to say it that way, but I like to say it that way because it inspires faith and a reality that Jesus has already paid the price. He has already bought us. Did you know that you were bought by the blood of Jesus? The only thing that could purchase us back from the enemy because we were under the bondage and the slavery of the enemy. When Adam and his wife committed sin, they partook of that forbidden tree, they gave the authority of the earth over to the devil. And that's why the devil, when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted for 40 days, he said, he showed him the kingdoms of the world. He said, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus didn't say, you liar, these kingdoms belong to my father. No, because Adam had given them over to the devil but now that we're born again we've been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son and it was only through the blood of jesus remember when uh, uh jesus said to the disciples whom do you say that i am and and peter said you are the christ the son of living god and then a little bit later on jesus began to talk about having to shed his blood and suffer and peter rebuked him and and jesus turned around and said get behind me satan for thou savest not the things of god but things that be of men and so what peter was saying he didn't realize it he was saying jesus you don't have to shed your blood for us oh no there would be no salvation without the shedding of the blood of jesus he had to shed his blood. He had to pour out his blood, every drop of blood for our redemption. Now it talks, and, and there is a warning uh, about treading afresh upon the blood of Christ in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be, he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. For in other words, what Jesus did when he shed his blood was not giving us permission or, or a, 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 a debit card to commit sin. Now, are we going to sin? We're going to sin. What do we do? We repent. We acknowledge it. We turn from it, right? And the Bible says a righteous man will fall down seven times, but he gets back up. And matter of fact, when, they, and when the disciples said, Lord, how many times should we forgive? And he said, 70 times 70. So God has a, a, a willingness to, to forgive us uh, of our transgressions. I'm talking about after we're born again. Uh, I, I, now, now, this theology that all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, that's a lie. That's not a the Bible, because otherwise we wouldn't have to confess our sins. If all my, now it says, matter of fact, and there's a scripture that says that, uh, that his blood was shed for sins that you had previously committed. Uh, uh, so when I, when I miss the will of God, I, 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 I repent from my heart. I acknowledge it, but we never, never treat the work, the, the redemptive work of Christ in our lives as if it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bottomless debit card that we can just keep living our lives the way we want and get away with it. That, that's, that, you know, I, I really, it concerns me. I think the fear of the Lord has departed from much of the church today. You know, and, and people just treat what Christ did as if it, it's a bottomless debit card or a bottomless banking account system. No, no, no. We, 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 dare, we dare walk not 
tread upon the blood of Jesus. We, we got to walk softly and, and aware and be conscious of the fact that when we miss God, and we all miss God, you know, the Bible says, if any man says his sin is not, he's a liar and the truth ain't in him. So we acknowledge we miss God and many times in the fact that anything that is not a faith is sin. So we acknowledge it, but we don't, we don't just go out here and blatantly uh, just ignore God's will and do what the flesh wants. Hebrews eleven twenty eight through faith, they kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Hebrews 12, 24, and to Jesus, the mediator, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Hebrews 13, 11, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. So notice we're sanctified, separated, consecrated because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, just one more scripture, Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So let me just um, cover some of these major issues about the blood. Uh, I read this to you before, but I'm going to read it to you again. These are 15 declarations. Uh, number one, by the blood we overcome. We overcome by faith in the blood of Christ. You know, it says... Uh, they, they overcome by the blood of lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives on their death. Number two, there's propitiation by the blood. I taught that last Thursday. Propitiation. That's a big Hebrew word or a Greek word, but it's important. Number three, we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Before Christ died, the Gentiles, what we call the heathen, they were separated from God because we didn't have the Abrahamic covenant. But now because of what Christ did through his blood, there is no longer no difference between a, a, a Gentile believer and a Jewish believer. I, I know there's, and, and thank God our, our Jewish brethren are getting born again, but there's just too much emphasis of, 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 of the Jewish laws. We're free from the Jewish laws. We're not under the laws of feast days, holy days, new moon days, Sabbath days, or physical circumcision. And, and matter of fact, to be honest, the, the teachings of the old covenant were so deeply ingrained in the Jewish people that after the resurrection of Christ, and they even got the revelation that there needed to be no more animal sacrifices, a lot of the Jewish believers, people who believed on Christ, continued to be involved in animal sacrifice. Uh, they, they didn't need to be. That was all a type of shadow and illustration of Christ. He fulfilled the Old Testament law. All of those Old Testament principles or teachings or symbols, touch not, taste not, handle not, uh, they, they were no longer, should have been enforced in the Jewish people. But they, they were so ingrained that they just couldn't let go. You know, a lot of times there's things in our life we have just been brought up to believe certain things. Uh, we have certain attitudes, certain thoughts, certain ideals. And, and that's how my mom did it. That's how my dad did it. I remember years ago I heard the story about this family. They were getting together, and, and uh, uh, when, when it came to, I guess, I think it was right around uh, Easter, the, the whole family get together, and uh, great-great-grandma was there. And so they took a ham and they cut the ham in half and they put the ham in two different pans and they cooked it in the oven. And, and, and great, great grandma was sitting there and saying, well, why are you guys cutting that ham in half and baking it in two different uh, 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 pans? And they, they said, well, that's how we've always done it. That's tradition. She said, no, I started that. She said, I didn't have a pan big enough to contain the whole ham. And so I would cut the ham in half and put it in the two small pans I had. But you see, because it had been passed down, they were cooking their ham the way that great, great grandma did it. And she only did it because she didn't have a pan that was big enough. 
Well, I think a lot of times that's how Christian traditions start, is this is how you do it. This is, to you know, like in Catholicism, and I was raising Catholicism, we'd sprinkle holy water, hello, you know, and we would do the sign of the cross. You know, there's no power in holy water, and there's no power in the sign of the cross. Uh, it's just traditions we pick up. Now, not all traditions are harmful, but what happened in, in, in the early church is they were so ingrained in the, uh, the laws of Moses that they were trying to push them over onto the Gentile believers, which was actually taking them out of faith. See, it takes faith in Christ, in the blood of Christ, to come out of religious traditions that really don't have, uh, that, that really don't make a difference. I'll give you an example. I know it's a touchy one, but let's talk about just for a little bit about the Sabbath. I, when I first got born again, you know, I just loved Jesus every day of my life, and I ran into what we call Seventh-day Adventist and uh, started working with them, and right away they, they try to put upon me, well, the Sabbath day is Saturday. You got to worship God on Saturday, and then if you worship God on Sunday, which was the first day of the week when Christ raised from the dead, uh, they, 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 that, 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 that's a mark of the beast. How many of you were ever told that? <laughs> and that's what they teach. They teach you it was a mark of the beast. But then they would take you into the fact that you can't eat pork and you can't eat unclean animals. And I saw right away, I said, well, that's not what I read in my Bible. That's not what I see Jesus taught. And Paul dealt with this later on. He said to one person, one day is to the Lord, and to another person, every day is to the Lord. Let every person in their own mind, in their heart, own heart be convinced. Now, don't get me wrong. I know people really get upset if people work on Sundays. I, I don't, you know, that's funny because I've worked on Sundays for the last uh, 45 years. Sunday's my work day. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm, I, I'm good with us coming together on Sundays. That's wonderful. Or on a Saturday or on a Thursday night or on a Monday night or a Tuesday night. I believe that we should come together. But see, what I'm saying here is that traditions can eat away at really what's important. See, we should study the feast days, holy days, new moon days, and all of those things as, as typology or shadow or illustrations of who Jesus really is. That's what they are. They're illustrations of the, the Passover lamb. There was no salvation in that dead carcass. There was no salvation in that blood of the lamb. It was all looking forward to Jesus, but now we have Jesus. <laughs> We have the real thing. We have the truth. And so the truth should make us free from what we really don't need anymore. You know, I, I've known a lot of born-again, spirit-filled Christians that get around, uh, 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 the, 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 you know, what they call completed Jews and Messianic congregations. And the next thing you know, they're trying to keep the Messianic, they're trying to keep the laws. I'm saying, well, Wait. Why, why do you, you don't have to put that little thing on your head, guys. You don't have to wear that prayer shawl. That prayer shawl don't mean anything. There's symbolism involved in it, but the, the price has been paid. The blood has been shed. Christ is the Passover. As a matter of fact, Paul said that. He said, Christ, who is our Passover. And what do you mean Passover? That means that the death angel cannot come upon us anymore. Okay, so we're made nigh by the blood. Number four, remission of sins by the blood. Five, we're purged by the blood. Uh, that means we're, the, the, the sins have been purged. We've been cleansed. We've been purified. There's reconciliation through the blood. Number eight, there's peace, only peace through the blood. Number nine, there's redemption in the blood. Number 10, the blood created what we call the new and everlasting covenant. Remember Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it on leavened bread, and then he took the grape juice and he said, drink it for in this in, in my blood is the covenant, the new covenant. The old covenant was actually ratified and sealed through physical circumcision. Now, I, I'm not saying that you can't be, be circumcised, guys. It's, I guess it's, it's healthy. It's okay. Uh, as a Catholic, you know, you know, Catholic baby, I was circumcised. But, you know, uh, that, that, that circumcision, Paul says, whether you're circumcised or not circumcised, it doesn't matter. He said the only thing that matters is the new creation. 
we're new creatures. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But they were pushing physical circumcision upon the Gentile people who had believed in Christ. And, and Paul had to fight this stuff tooth and nail. That The whole book of Galatians is Paul coming against this foolishness. The book of Colossians is Paul coming against this foolishness because they, tradition got so deeply ingrained in them. And I don't blame them. They had carried down that tradition for almost 2,000 years, and all of a sudden Jesus comes along, he fulfills it, and he says, you don't need it anymore, people. Say, I don't need it anymore. You know, and don't argue with people. If people, I, I, I've just let people go. We had a, a, a gentleman came up from Frederick, nice brother. Uh, he was a worship leader, uh, and him and his whole family and some of the people, and um, uh, he considered himself a uh, uh, a messianic believer you know i didn't never argue with him but i knew what was going to happen and and they they would lead worship at times remember wonderful worship but and and he wanted to take me and kathy out to eat one day and i said to my wife i said well honey i said we better get ready i said because what well, he is so caught up in the messianic stuff he, it's become his religion it's not jesus it's messianic doctrines it's not see our gospel is jesus christ and uh, I said, we're going to try to handle it very gently. I said, but he'll be leaving because he's so, it's his God. It's his God. And so we went out to eat. And sure enough, he began to bring it up the Sabbath day and not eating uh, anything that's unclean like pork or, you know, uh, with cleft hooves, you know, on and on and on. And, and, and I, I didn't argue with him. I said, and I began to quote scriptures. But, you know, it's amazing because as I quoted uh, uh, scriptures, what Paul declared about this, he, he was so deeply ingrained with the theology that you had to keep these Levitical customs that he couldn't hear a word that Paul said he couldn't hear it and so they left the church and never came back again I'm sorry I can't help that but I'm not going to come underneath your bondage in order to make you feel spiritual People, they try to make themselves feel spiritual because they do certain things. You know what I mean? That don't make you spiritual. You know what makes you spiritual? Loving Jesus Christ more than anything. <laughs> you want to be spiritual? Love Jesus more than you love the world, more than you love the flesh. Deny yourself. So uh, redemption, number nine, there's redemption through his blood. Ten, there's a new and everlasting covenant in his blood. Number 11, there's only forgiveness by the blood of Jesus. I'll read some of the scriptures for this before we close here in a couple of minutes. You're washed, number 12, you're washed and you're cleansed by the blood. Number 13, you're sanctified the by the blood. Number 14 is so important, you're purchased and you're bought by the blood. He said, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Jesus bought me with his blood. Isn't that amazing? That's how you were able to be redeemed. That's how you were be able to ransom. That's how you were able to be bought. You said, Pastor Mike, I just don't know if God loves me. Well, I, you know, when I got born again, and I saw what Christ did upon the cross, and I saw that he shed all of his blood. It got rid of ever the thought that God loved me. God, God proved his love. I mean, what more can you do? God gave his life. As a matter of fact, the Jesus, Jesus said the real evidence of love is that if you lay down your life for your brother. Well, you know what? Jesus laid down his life for us, didn't he? He bought me with his blood. Now, because he bought me, that means I'm, I'm free from the devil. I don't belong to him anymore. Let's say, for instance, that you had a debt that you could not pay. And some wealthy person that you really didn't know very well, and actually the Bible says when we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Some stranger comes along and he buys your debt. He pays for your debt and he gives you the receipt. And he hands you the receipt and he says to you now, if they come back and they try to claim that you owe them anything, just present to them the bill of sales that it's complete right here. It's paid in full. I don't know about you, but whenever I deal with local contractors or like uh, if I go to pay a bill, I always have them signed paid on the receipt with their signature. And I keep that in my records. 
because, you know, people can make mistakes and try to come back on you. So if somebody pays off my massive debt, which I was never able to pay, and one day there's a knock on my door, and there's maybe the sheriff with the guy who says I owe him the money, and he comes and he says, hey, listen, you owe us this amount of money, and I'm going to pull out my receipt. I'm going to hold it up. I'll say, I'll make a copy of it. There it is, paid in full. You have nothing to lay claim on. Listen, that's what Jesus did with his blood. So when the devil comes knocking at your door in your life, and he begins to try to pull you back into bondage. He tries to pull you back into the lies. He tries to he tries to claim you as one of his own. Just hold up the receipt and say, no, by the blood of Jesus, I've been redeemed. By the blood of Jesus, I've been forgiven. By the blood of Jesus, I've been cleansed. I've been sanctified. I, 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 the atonement has been paid for. And by the blood of Jesus, you have no claim on me. Say that. By the blood of Jesus, devil, world, flesh. You have no claim on me. You know, that's what it says there in Romans, actually. It says, for brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So I'm not indebted. I don't owe flesh anything. I don't owe him anything. Jesus paid the price for my life, and I now belong to him. I am so glad that if you could see in the spirit and turn me upside down and see in the bottom of my feet, you'd see it on yours too, made in heaven. <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't made in heaven. Yeah, but you've been recreated. You're a new creature. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So I'm washed by the blood. I'm sanctified by the blood. I'm purchased by the blood. And by, I have the life of Christ in me through the blood. Now, isn't that amazing? Because in John chapter 6, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Uh, it says, whoever eats my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So how, how do we drink the blood of Jesus? Well, uh, of course, the flesh of Jesus, I believe, is the word of God. We got to eat. It says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And we, 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 ha we, we drink the blood of Jesus by faith. If we don't, it's not, it's not in Catholicism. We were taught that you got to take the wafer and it's amazing because only the priests get to drink the, the, the wine. I don't know why, but when I used to go down and kneel, the priest would always put this little, uh, 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 uh wafer on my tongue and, and, and they try to convince us that was literally physically the body of Jesus himself. Well, it's not, it's just an act of faith. So we do partake of communion as an act of faith. But that unleavened bread that we eat could be a crack or whatever, or that grape juice that we drink, that is not the physical body and the physical blood of Jesus. It's an aspect of faith. See, by faith, the, the just shall live by what? Faith. Not feelings, not our emotions, not our circumstances. So we apply the blood by faith. By the blood of Jesus, I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed, I'm delivered. Um, and like I said, there's 15, I found 15 major aspects when it comes to the blood of Jesus, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, we're justified by the blood. Number six, Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The wrath of God is abiding on those who have not believed on Christ because the blood of Christ is not upon them. The minute you believed on Christ in, in, in the realm of the spirit, you were covered in the blood of Jesus. So that death angel that has come to steal, kill, and destroy, uh, he, 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 see, the devil, if he can convince you that he has a right to attack you, and, and you don't stand up for your rights. You know, I, I, I mean, I know we live in America, okay? So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, I, I rent, I have a place that's considered a bed and breakfast where I take guys out of jail. And now if you rent from a landlord by the month or by every two weeks, they got to give you 30 days notice. They got to, and then they can go to the magistrate. And at one time I rented a house that way and it took me six months to get the people out. They never gave me a penny. Well, because I'm a bed and breakfast, we have what we call the Landlord's Protection Act of 1996, and it's just like a hotel or a motel. So when these guys come in, I rent to them by the day or by the week, 
Okay. And I said, okay, guys, here's the deal. I said, here's the rules of the house. And I said, if you break these rules and I'm not a hard nose, but if you break these rules, I can put you out there, put you out that very, very day, right then and there's just like a hotel. Well, of course, when I get troublemakers, they all get in my face and yell and scream and threaten me. You can't put me out. You got to give me 30 days notice and I'll hold up the landlord's protection act of 1996. Here it is. Hold it up. I said, right there it is. I said, you're leaving today. The one guy, he pulled a knife on another guy. I said, you're out today. Another guy, he had brought some crack uh, into the house. Another, another time, a guy snuck a girl in that because you're not allowed to have guests or visitors. You know, we're not a house of prostitution. And he, he, he snuck a, at one time, it was the middle of the winter. At three o'clock in the morning, the Spirit of God woke me up and said, get up on the hill problems so it was a blizzard out so i went up there and i went into the front room of the house i have up there and I, i'm not being graphic i go into the living room and here the guy is who's giving me problems he's on the couch with a, with a, with a young lady and they're involved i stopped it right i said oh stop get up get dressed what i said you're going out that door right now you can't put me out this middle it's a snowstorm i said you're out the door right now i said i warned you warned you warned you and so i kicked him out well uh so i put this young buck out and the police at times would challenge me and i had this police officer called me up young guy i could tell he said uh mr yeager i said yeah he said well you just kicked so and so out of the house i said oh absolutely i did well, you can't do that. You got to give him a notice. I said, no, sir. I said, Landlord's Protection Act of 1996. Well, you can't do that. I said, sir. I said, I have a legal right. I said, I'm going to be very polite to you. I said, you don't create the laws. You enforce the laws. And I said, I have the law on my side. He's out. He's not getting back in. Well, I'll get a hold of the district attorney. I said, you go right ahead and you talk to the district attorney. So I knew he lied. I was out eating with a pastor and his wife, my wife and I, and about a a half an hour later he calls me up and i knew he was lying he said i talked to the district attorney you can't do that i said well i said the district attorney's wrong and i said i'm gonna obey the law and i said don't call me no more call my attorney and i hung up and he left me alone but in the last 20 years as i have taken guys out of prison i've had police over and over try to uh make me do what they demand me to do but i hold up the law 1996 landlords protection act officer here it is i said i can put them out for any reason and i said i don't put them out for any reason i'll put them out when i believe they're a threat to the community i said they're out now i don't care how much they threaten to put me in jail blah 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 i have the law on my side let me say this we've got the blood of jesus people the devil has no right he has no claim. He has no power. He has no dominion over us because of the blood of Jesus. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. So if you commit sin and when you repent, you say, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have acted like that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have done that. Lord, please forgive me. I repent right now. Please forgive me. The Bible says you confess your sins to him. He's faithful and just to forgive you and to do what? Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So then the devil's going to try to come back and say, you did this and you did this and you did this. And I'm not going to argue with him. I said, well, yeah, you're right. But praise God, I repented from the sincerity of my heart. Praise God, it's washed away. It's not under the blood. It's washed away by the blood. I'm cleansed. I'm purified. I am forgiven. The Bible says we are forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Say, thank God I'm forgiven. Really, are you glad? I'm glad I'm forgiven. Oh, I, I know what I, I deserve hell, people. I know I deserve hell, but thank God I'm forgiven. Now, like I said, it's not a license to commit sin, but when I truly repent in my heart to the best degree that I know how, and I, I don't want to do it no more, I don't want to think it no more, I don't want to act that way anymore. Now, I look to him, give me strength to not give in to that again. But Lord, I thank you by the blood of Jesus. Now, Father, we thank you tonight that because of the precious, wonderful, cleansing, justifying, purifying, purchasing, sanctifying blood of Jesus, we are redeemed. We are delivered. 
We are set free. We are justified. We are ransomed. Lord, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen.